So first, before we get uh, get started with this session, quick uh, quick announcement. Um, so tomorrow there are still uh, six session chair slots. Sorry, three session chair slots. There's uh, two talks in each slot open. Um, if you'd like to chair a session, it's literally just what I'm doing now. You stand up here, uh, say some stuff, introduce the speaker, and then sit down. It, it's it's not that hard, and it's a nice way to get some practice standing up in front of people and talking. Uh, to sign up to those, go to the uh, the conference schedule, and there's a little button that says volunteer. Just click on that. Um, so yeah, if anyone's interested in doing that, that would be uh, greatly appreciated by the organizers. Um, moving along, Lev is a system software engineer, uh, currently studying at the Imperial Co College London and previously interning at Apple and Red Hat. He's going to take us through the features of the Linux, uh, sorry, of Linux and computing hardware that allows debuggers to do their jobs with Let's Write a Debugger. Please make Lev feel welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, hello, my name is Lev. That is not my full name, but this is what people call me, and that's what I prefer. Um, so there's a few, few sentences about me. I'm a final year undergrad student at Imperial College London in the UK. It's a 22-hour flight away. Uh, previously, I worked at Apple <laughs> and at Red Hat, uh, mostly working in operating systems and low-level performance engineering, that sort of thing. Uh, I usually write code in C, Haskell, which is my pet. I just love Haskell. It's a beautiful language. Recently, I started writing in Rust, and um, this debugger that we're writing during this talk will also be written in Rust. Hey, yes, go on. Like I, I wanted some uh, excitement. Uh, I also sometimes write in Go, but I'm not that excited about Go. <laughs> um, so, before we start, it's usually a good thing to go over the history of debuggers. Uh, we'll find that it's very closely tied with computers in general. Um, Who's familiar with TX0 and MIT? Raise your hands. Okay, so it's a, it's a big single user machine. Um, it was one of the world's first computers. Um, and the way it usually worked, um, so the way you usually develop programs for this TX0 machine is that you wrote some program, you loaded the assembler program into TX0, and then assembled your, and then that assembly your program gave you another, pip, uh, another punch card which then you inserted into TX0 and then I executed your program. Um, and then at that point your program breaks. And that's why, and then you repeat this process and this is obviously very time consuming and so people didn't like that. Uh, and so what they did is they loaded a little program on top of the RAM or the memory at that time and which was able to single step through instructions and uh, examine memory, modify registers, basically what debuggers do these days. At the same time, however, there were batch processing machines, which is a different type of machine. Uh, you had all these little punch cards tied together, and then you gave those, that little deck to someone, an operator, who then gave you back the results later today or the next day, depending on when the computer was executed. <laughs> um, so the way you debug these machines is because you didn't have access to a computer directly, is that you put macro calls that gave you snapshots, which are basically just a dump of all the registers in the computer, or you called another macro that would give you a core dump, which is basically just the entire uh, memory. You dump, it dumped the entire memory to some paper. And then once the program crashed, you would be able to figure out why and how it crashed based on clues left in the memory um, and all that sort of stuff. Also, you, can, you could have looked at the registers. Uh, then a few years later, computing uh, resources have become stronger and stronger. And there was a new operating system called T CTSS, which is the uh, compatible time sh sharing system where multiple users could log in simultaneously and do their work. Uh, at that point, however, people realized that, hey, we can do something better than previous debugging, uh, is that you could have printf debugging, which I assume everyone, have, everyone here has used. <laughs> uh, you put a statement, it gives you some clues about what's happening. For instance, you could see here, it's kind of obvious what's gonna happen. Uh, you're going to get a sec fault on line three, and that's how you can bisect basically where your code crashed uh, and why. That's also very important. So that this, this became a nice cycle of you, you, you write your program, it crashes, you had a printf, you figure out that it crashed earlier, you had another one and another one, and then eventually find that particular line that was offending. Um, and this was very effective. And then came Unix, uh, which we all love. Or hate. Um, and it had a debugger called DB, and uh, 
GNU had the debugger called GDB, which should be very familiar. And uh, it also had a debugger called LLDB, which is nowadays mostly on Mac systems. Uh, Plan 9 had ADB, which is another debugger. They're basically all similar debuggers, and uh, they all look similar to GDB these days, which is what I use most of the time, if I'm not printf debugging. Um, so, for the history behind us, let's talk a little about how do we trace a process? How do we go ahead and start debugging? So let's, let's go with that. So this is the system call ptrace. Who's familiar with this system call? Oh, that's incredible. That's much more than I expected. Um, so basically, yeah, it's a system for those of you are not aware. This is a system call where you can give requests and a target process ID, and that particular process can be manipulated or information can be requested about that particular process. Um, most of the debuggers heavily rely on this because it, it's, it's, it's a portable way of between different architectures. So the same code that's meant to work on x86 will also probably work on ARM or other architectures. Small caveats, of course. Uh, but before we go into ptrace, it's a little important to decide how signals work and how they are triggered, because it's, p signals are very important when it comes to ptrace. Uh, in this particular example, we have A and B. Uh, it's a typical example of a division by zero. Uh, basically, what happens is that division is zero is noticed by the CPU. The CPU raises a divide error, which is a internal state, and eventually it calls an interrupt line, which calls into the kernel. The kernel does a lot of magic figures out what happened, who did the pro who was the offending process, and then sends a SIGFPE, which is the signal for zero division by zero. At that point, your signal handle will be called, um, if you're lucky. If it's a sick kill that was sent to you, then it's not going to be called. You're, you're, you're thrown out of everything. Um, and uh, with that, signals are very important to ptrace, and with that, we'll start a little implementing. And let me show you what the, the final product will be. Is this readable? Or do you need a larger font? It's a bit green. It's a bit <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I wish I could do something about that. Um, so this is the debugger we'll be using. This is what the final product will look like. You can, similarly as in GDB, you would start a process just like that. If I press H, it's going to tell you all the features it supports. Uh, for instance, what we can do is step through. It goes to show that it has like this assembly, shows the current uh, instruction pointer, which is RIP. Uh, it also shows the stack pointer, RSP, and the frame pointer, which is RBP. Um, we can also continue it to a next system call. And this is basically like S trace. Uh, it, it tells you that it invokes system call 12 with that particular result, and then it did system call 21 with that particular result. Um, now we have breakpoints, of course. We'll also implement breakpoints. With LSB, we can see that there are no breakpoints set yet. Uh, and then, of course, with B, we can go ahead and, implement and uh, type in an address uh, to set a breakpoint, and then, of course, press C to continue. Um, now we can see that would see uh, it executed some part of the code, and then it hit a breakpoint at that address. Now, if I press R, it gives me a dump of all the registers. And uh, if I note that it has 2D, which is uh, 32 plus 14, that would be uh, 46. So if I press continue now, it will ask me to make a guess. This is a simple guessing game. It literally you just it gets a random number, and then it you, you type that. You're familiar with a guess the number game. Uh, so if I, pr if I type in 2D, which is 36 plus thir uh, thir 32 plus uh, something, I can't count. D is, B is, B is 11, C is 12, 13. So that's uh, 32 plus 13, that's 45. And that is the uh, correct number. So it works. You, you were able to look at all the registers, get a little debugger. I'll get a little disassembly, and this is what we're going to build during this talk. Well, we'll build the important parts, at least, because all the boilerplate I've written that previously. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, let's start with tracing. So before, if we, before we want to trace a process, the process has to tell us that, hey, I want to be traced, like I want to be, you know, monitored. And um, 
there's, there's of course a ptrace request for that, which is trace me. If you, if you inf invoke ptrace trace me, then, uh, oops, and it will tell the kernel that, hey, it's okay for me, it's okay that if another process comes along, it can read my registers, read my memory, or even modify it. Um, so, let's get to the code. Fingers crossed it works. Um, so that is very simple, and this is Rust code. Who's familiar with Rust? I am very, very enthusiastic for Rust. Um, so it basically issues a ptrace request from the process that, hey, it's okay for me to be traced. And uh, yeah, so but naturally there's a question arises, like how am I gonna get a process to invoke the system call, right? Well, it turns out that uh, Linux has a nice system call called fork, where you create a new process and then you can, you can execute a few system calls before you do something else. So uh, once we forked, uh, we'll be able to go and invoke a system call. So we can just do um, p trace trace me. If I could type, that would be useful. And that will, be, that will tell the kernel that, hey, this new process is to be traced. Uh, if we go down, we do some magic with like set up the uh, environment variables, uh, the arguments, and all that sort of things that we don't care about right now. And then we execute the program that we were given in this particular line. Is this line readable? It's got like, I think, I think my highlight matches this room pretty well. <laughs> uh, that's not meant to be like that, but whatever. Um, so it executes that program. So at that point, the kernel knows that this process can be traced and this is now running that particular program, which is the, in this particular example, the cast the game. All right, so let's try what happens if we, if we do that. Uh, okay. So it attached successfully. Nothing crashed, we're good for now. What if I tried a single step? Oh, well, it's not implemented yet. So um, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so I mentioned run until system call because that's something ptrace can do and that's how strace is implemented. I am not really going to go through implementing this particular thing because it's very complicated. It involves a state machine, uh, which I think would be pretty boring. Uh, the, this two, two system call requests here, ptrace syscall is basically, hey, run until the next system call, entry or exit. And that's how you can get uh, the ptrace. You can figure out what system call was invoked and then get this result back. Uh, and that's how S-trace works. On the other hand, there are, there's sysmu, which is run until the next system call, but do not execute that system call. So it lets the, uh, lets the debugger emulate that particular system call, which is handy for um, a number of, for instance, QEMU user mode and other, and other, um, other sub pieces of software. <clears throat> uh, the next thing we're gonna implement is a register dump to be able to look at all the registers. And for that, there is a number of, number of very useful uh, ptrace requests. One of them is the peak user and poke user, which lets you look at one particular register and modify that particular register. <clears throat> and then you have get regs and set regs, which is get me all the registers. And uh, you can do whatever you want with them and then reset them with set registers. <clears throat> so uh, the way that works, as we go here, this is, the, this is just an input state machine. It's not the most ideal at all, but uh, we wanna get the registers, so that is very easy. Create a new variable called registers. We get the program, and then we get the user struct, which is what, um, the other way, what uh, get regs returns you. It returns you a user struct, which contains all the registers. Uh, I don't know why it's called user struct, but that's what it is. Um, and then from that, we can, there's a substructure that has all the registers. And very handily, I have a list of things that I, this is just accidentally my Vim, you know, every single time I have to do something with registers, this is always in it, most of the time. So now if we compile it, we'll be able to do, oops, yeah, that's exactly, that, that works. So if we, if we do registers, we'll be able to see a dump of registers, which is very handy. You have all the, uh, all the registers from uh, 64-bit x86, and even the segment registers, and everything that you could get. Uh, E-flags as well, which is the extended flag register. That's where all the flags are. So at this point, we still can't single step, right? That doesn't work, of course. 
So let's go back and um, <coughs> let's go implement uh, single stepping. Arguably, there is a ptest request for that. It's very handy. You do ptest single step. It's literally just that. What that's what, what you need to implement. So uh, if I go here, this is where we painted before in this particular line. So if I delete that and the comment, then I can do ptrace single step uh, self that target uh, PID because the uh, prototype of ptrace is you have to give it the process ID. Well, no, so first you have to give it the request, but that request is uh, abstracted away with my ptrace library, uh, which is literally just a few lines. Like it's very simple. Um, so that works. Uh, if I compile it, and at that point, we should be able to single step. And uh, yeah, that works. Cool. Nothing crashed so far. That is awesome. Uh, you can see that, so you can see that there's this assembly, but I, uh, this assembly is provided by a different library. It's not a trivial thing to do, and uh, I will not go over that. Just, just assume that that's a nice thing. Um, yeah, so you can now get all the registers, do a single step egg and uh, whatever you want. So the next, next thing would be, yeah, breakpoints. That is a very important thing. <clears throat> oh yeah, sorry. So before we go over that, we have, we have like Peter's request to manipulate memory, which is what we will need for breakpoints. Uh, so you, you have peek and poke text, which basically means like, hey, modify this particular word in the, uh, in the text section of the running executable program, and peek data, that does the same, but with the data section. Now, there's a different, as this on Linux, at least, there's no different address spaces, so everything is in the same address space, text and data. So these two, two requests, they all do the same with respect to peak text and peak data, and poke text and poke data, they all do the same. <coughs> Except peak is the read one and poke is the write one, uh, of course. So, uh, we've seen a little about ptrace, but we don't really know how it's working, right? So. It's very easy to just pass everything onto the operating system and then let it go do, do its work. What's interesting though, at least to me, is how it works. Uh, and we're gonna start with our little friend, Petra single step. Is that my cursor there? It's not longer there. Um, so on x86 there exists this beautiful register called eFlags, uh, which is the flag register. It has all the bits and had, has left different like um, flags in it. And we have one particular flag, TF, which is the trace flag, or the trap flag, depending on which literature you're reading. And um, yeah, trap flag, or sometimes referred to as trace flag. And basically, this is what it does. After each instruction, it starts an it goes into an interrupt. That's a debug interrupt. Uh, the kernel does some magic, and then eventually sends a sick trap to that process. Um, that is then delivered to the debugger via a wait event. And Debugger can then do whatever it wants. For instance, continue single stepping to the next instruction. So basically, how single stepping works is you got your process sets a flag in the um, uh, in the E flags register, and then after every instruction, it stops, and then a signal is delivered to the uh, to the process. <coughs> now let's talk a little about breakpoints, which is what we'll be implementing next. Um, there are multiple ways to implement breakpoints. One of them that people did before was the UD2 instruction, which is guaranteed to be a undefined instruction on x86. Now the problem with this is that it's two bytes, so it's a little difficult to replace two bytes at one point. Um, it also triggers the undefined instruction exception instead of a nicer instruction, uh, nicer interrupt. So there's a better way of doing this, which is the third interrupt which triggers the breakpoint exception. And the machine covered for interrupt, for, in, for the third interrupt is the 0xcc, which is one byte. It's always easy to modify one byte in most cases, except in some other cases, but we don't care about that. Um, so yeah, with that being said, this is the theory of how you would do, how you would implement a uh, breakpoint at a given address. You get the byte at that address, you replace it with, uh, the machine code for in the third interrupt, which is 0xcc. Um, you take note of the previous instruction because eventually you have to restore that, right? Uh, when the breakpoint is hit, you replace it with the original byte. <coughs> and then you try and 
try executing the instruction again. Uh, no banner, you could, you could probably use UD2, but it's a lot more complex, and here we're going to be using uh, interrupt 3. So um, let's go and uh, implement that. First of all, let's close this. This is not need. Um, so basically, what happens is uh, when you, if only I could type. OK, I can't type. But um, when you, so this is how it works. When you type in B, it, we get a address from it. This is not probably not the best way to do it, but this is uh, what I could come up with at, at this time. And um, we call a function called set breakpoint, which is implemented here. And yeah, of course, it says currently it's not implemented. So let's delete that comment. Uh, and basically, let's go and uh, implement it. So as the site said, the first thing we have to do is look at that byte that was there. So let's just save that, which is a byte. Uh, and um, there's a handy function that I've written, which uses the ptrace peak, user, uh, peak text to get a byte from a location. This does some magic with like, uh, this does some bitwise magic that we don't necessarily need. Uh, but the idea is that it gets that byte and everything is, everyone is happy. Um, so now we have the original byte. What we need to do is go there and write 0xcc to trigger an interrupt. So there's another handy function, poke byte add, which is location and then write 0xcc. Now, of course, we're good programmers, so we put a comment that 0xcc is the machine code for Internet 3. We <coughs> like comments, right? We like comments. There we go. So that means at this point, we have, we have saved the original byte and then modified that instruction to be the third interrupt. So at that point, if the CPU executes that instruction, it will trap into uh, an interrupt handler and send a signal to the process. So uh, the only thing we need to do now is to save the previous um, data. <clears throat> so we create, we have a vector and we put in a new data, which is literally just uh, the address is the location and the original byte is the original byte. So we save that data, put it into a list structure so that later we can retrieve it. That's fine. Now we can set breakpoints, but the other part problem is that we still need to handle them. And of course, there's a function that I've written that is called when, an, when, a, uh, when a breakpoint is hit. And what we do here is basically just we have to loop through all the, um, all the breakpoints and find that particular breakpoint that was triggered. <clears throat> and then we do. Let breakpoint, we get, so we loop through all the breakpoints. We have to get that particular breakpoint, and that is self that breakpoints. We clone it because I'm too lazy to figure out all the references. So if BP, that if the address of the breakpoint triggers is the same as the instruction that triggered that breakpoint, then that means we have a breakpoint hit, which is great. So at that time, we, what we have to do basically is to replace the, the 0xcc that was written to trigger this interrupt with the original value, which is, of course, handily stored in that particular breakpoint structure. Now there's a problem. So the CPU has, has completely finished in, um, executing that instruction, which triggered the interrupt. But the next instruction is corrupted because we replaced only one byte. We didn't replace the entire thing. So we have to tell the CPU to go back one, press, one in instruction and execute that instruction uh, that was originally there. So the way we do that is we have the user structure that I handily copied here. And um, inside that, set the registers to be the, uh, the register minus one. Because we, we executed one byte of instructions, but we have to go back to that to try that instruction again. And uh, that is handily done by doing write it back to the kernel. Now, of course, if something bad happens, you put like an oops, something bad happened. And uh, if we run that at that point, everything's happy. Sweet. So now we can put a breakpoint as previously uh, we did it. And uh, if we do see, oh, yes, oh, no. Something didn't quite work. 
Oh, yeah. You're right. Thank you. Sweet. Try again. That is an address I memorized, by the way, if you haven't yet noticed. And uh, the only significance of that is that you can dump the registers and then see here uh, uh, the actual value that was randomly generated. So we calculate again 3 times 16 plus 11, that's 59. Uh, so if we continue, then we can make a guess. Well, it's not 58. Well, it's not 60. It's got to be 59. So we can use our debugger to look at all the registers, do breakpoints, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So that is cool. We can implement now breakpoints. So there are other ways of implementing breakpoints. Uh, this, is, this is, by the way, called a software breakpoint. There is another class of breakpoints called hardware breakpoints, which we will cover on this slide. Um, so there's, um, there's a few set of registers called the debug registers on x86, which let you do a lot of magic with uh, linear addresses. So uh, in DR01 and 2 and 3, you can put addresses in it, particularly linear addresses, uh, which can be whatever. It can be virtual memory or physical memory, depending on how you set it up. And, um, the idea, the idea is that you can then tell the CPU to, hey, look at these addresses and mod notify me if something changes or something happens to those addresses. Uh, there's a register called DR6, which is the debug control register. <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a register where you can set bit masks to control what should happen and when, depending on the values in DR0 to DR3. So for instance, you can set, uh, hey, tell me that someone read that address, which is how watch points are implemented. You can, you can tell it to, hey, tell me if something wrote to that address or if someone tries to execute that address. Uh, you can tell it to monitor one, two, four, or eight bytes, depending on what you want. <clears throat> There's a debug status. So this register is used to, when, when you have an interrupt, to figure out which address caused that particular problem. Uh, you might be wondering. So we have DR0 to 3, 6, and 7. What happened to 4 and 5? Any guesses? There's literally not much. It's just deprecated, obsolete aliases, um, unfortunately. But that's, that's, uh, that's what happened to them. There's historical reasons. We're not going to cover that. It's mostly just a naming problem. So uh, with that being said, that is, that is most of what I had to say. I am very happy to take questions, uh, if there's anything. Um, thank you. I got it. <coughs> so if you have any questions, yeah. Um, if you have software breakpoints there, do you consume it? Sir? When the first time you hit the software breakpoint, you've effectively removed yeah. it. Yeah. Is there a regular technique for putting it back again? You uh, well, yeah, you can single step, and then once you tapped over that instruction. Please repeat the question. Oh, yeah. So the question was whether you can, uh, when you when I show you, you consume a breakpoint, whether you can have a recurring breakpoint that is automatically inserted. Uh, yes, you can. The, the way I would do it is you set up a single point right after. You execute that, the original instruction, and off, right after the instruction, you, you set back the, the breakpoint, um, which is something you can do if you want. But in this, in this particular example, I didn't implement that. It's just a one-off breakpoint. There was another question somewhere. Oh, yeah. Hi. Are the debug registers visible to the user program itself, or are they only available from the preface? So uh, the question was whether debug registers are available from user space. Uh, no, they are a protected resource. Only the kernel can modify them. I mean, the reason behind this is you can put any address in it. So you could technically put a kernel address in it. And then, you know, that's not ideal. So the way that happens is that you, you when I go back a little, you can see it's actually a lot faster this way. So there's this uh, poke user somewhere, peak user. That's the only way you can modify those debug registers. And the kernel actually does like uh, sanity checking. Then are you allowed to do that? If not, you are killed. <laughs> uh, if you are allowed, then it's fine and everything is happy. Yeah. Yeah? Can you repeat the question? If you've got a multi-byte instruction and you set the breakpoint by putting the 
So the question was whether if I put the, the zero XCC at the wrong at the uh, wrong location. Uh, it depends. Probably yes. So you always want to aim to put it at the very beginning of the instruction. So the address I memorized was, was an address like that. Um, modern debuggers, they have mechanisms avoiding that. Uh, like they, they actually understand machine code. I don't, nor, the, uh, nor does this pet debugger does it. But in, um, in modern debuggers, you can actually prevent that from happening. Also, another, another, most of the times when you set a breakpoint, you set it by you know, file and then line number. So that is extracted from dwarf, which is a format for debugging, debug information, which I didn't cover in this form because that is a fairly complicated thing. Um, but yeah, most of the time you can avoid the problem by using line numbers. And uh, if not, then the debugger will try to help you. This one. <laughs> sure. Um, in fact, I can probably just I can do something like this, and it will show if I open up a Chrome browser. One second. <gasps> no. <laughs> okay. So. so <laughs> The service I used to have, like, I have a, when I press T on a selection, it automatically uploads the selection to, and then you can, it gives you back a link. It's uh, having its bad day today. <laughs> so, yeah, you can have it, of course. It's, it's not on GitHub, sadly, but yeah. yeah. So I noticed the program you were debugging was single threaded. How much do threads complicate this? A lot. <laughs> uh, so the question was whether the, uh, whether a single threaded, so whether a multi-threaded program would complicate this a lot, yes, it will complicate it. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is deliberately a single core, I mean a single threaded uh, application. And multi-threaded, you gotta care about who's gonna get that signal delivered. There are other problems, and they just complicate and don't uh, they don't matter for the underlying uh, idea. That was yeah. Uh, but there was four hardware registers. What happens if you want to? Uh, so the question was, what happens if you want to monitor more than four locations that are available in debug, debug registers? You use a software breakpoint. <laughs> yeah. So with the software breakpoint, it was generating a zip trap or something? Yep. And there's two processes involved. There's a debugger and the process that's being debugged. Is the trap delivered to the debugger because they're part of the same group or something? So when you do, so, so this. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was whether, so there's two, two processes playing. There's a debugger and the debuggy. Uh, I guess you can call that debuggy. And uh, when a SIG trap is delivered, who gets that signal? Uh, so it's the process, the debuggy gets the signal, but that is intercepted by ptrace. So when you, when you execute trace me, when you begin, begin tracing, basically what happens is that it, it tells the kernel, hey, if any signal is delivered to me, let the, let, the, let the tracer know, so the, the, um, the debugger. And at that point, basically what happens is, on any signal, the, the trace program stops. And then it delivers a wait event to the debugger that you can use here. So you can see here that uh, I do a wait, and I get the status. And from that I can see that if, um, this is not even true anymore. But basically, we, you, you, you can use the standard C library wait functions to determine what happened. So if it was stopped, then that means it was a breakpoint. If it exited, then that means it exited, so you can do. And then, of course, here you can, do, you can get the, the, in the underlying signal number and then compare depending on what happened and then figure out what's exactly going on. Yeah? How is functionality like run to next line typically uh, implemented? So the question was how, how run on to the next line is implemented. Like step over? Like right. step to next line. Oh, yeah. So you got to, so basically you find uh, the address. So f f you find the address of that particular line where it starts from the dwarf information, uh, which is complicated. And um, once you have that address, you can set up a software breakpoint, for instance. That's one thing you can do. Any more questions? I don't see that. Yeah. yeah have you 
Oh, no. In this talk, I deliberately cover. So the question was whether I implemented this for ARM. Yeah. Uh, no, this talk only concerns x86. It's similar on ARM, depending on, I mean, so in ARM, there are, there are things that come into play. Uh, but this is mostly for x86, because what, that's what most people use at the moment, from what I see. Any more questions? So the question was whether there are any advantages to implementing this in Rust. Memory safety. Uh, <laughs> sure, it's a, yeah, well, it, it has to be unsafe at some point because it's, it's calling into unsafe code. Uh, that is libc, and that is not Rust's fault. It's C that's being unsafe. Um, and also just because I like Rust, and uh, people seem to be generally happy when they see Rust. And hey, it's pretty readable, usually. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just going to do this, so you don't see unreadable code. Um, yeah, that's, if there's any more questions, I'm happy to take them. No more questions. Cool. Thank you.